Hello and welcome. My name's Kristen. We're so glad that you're listening to this episode. This is a minisode because Chanel is unfortunately sick. She is not able to speak for very long, so she is not going to be joining for this episode. This episode is going to be kind of in two parts. I'm going to start with three different ghost stories I found, and then it'll be story time. Today I'm covering the ghosts of Port Elizabeth. Now, I know that it's called Gebera, Gebera, I don't know how to even pronounce it properly, but I was born in Port Elizabeth, so it will always be Port Elizabeth to me. I'm sorry, but that's how it is. (laughs) So we're starting with Richley House. In 1906, William Jones Wills commissioned the building of the Richley House. Over the years, it has been used for various purposes. During World War II, the building was used as a brothel, and after World War II, it was used as a post-war boarding house. It was also used as a general nursing home. Some of the experiences that people have had is that they have heard a baby crying, and then they've seen a nun that's walked through the rooms. A child and a woman have been seen walking through the hallway, dressed in period clothing. There are also reports of a grumpy old man wearing a grey coat who aggressively makes his way through the dining room into the kitchen, where he then rattles pots and pans. It is likely he is one of the military men who stayed in the house. It seems that most of these hauntings are residual, except for the one spirit in the domestic quarters who allegedly tries strangling the staff. There is not much information on the malevolent spirit, however, but you can imagine having been so many things that this building has seen a lot. It's been a private residence, it's been a brothel, it's been a boarding house, a nursing home. I mean, nursing homes in general, the elderly pass away, you know... um, Post-war boarding house, maybe some soldiers had injuries and died from that. I mean, we've covered brothels and prostitution before, and we've seen that some sex workers have been murdered. The fact that there's a baby crying could also be connected to the days it was a brothel. Maybe one of the sex workers got pregnant and had a baby. There are so many untold stories about this place, and it's just interesting to see what kind of residual energy is still there. I would love to see a proper investigation done into this place. But now we move to the Port Elizabeth Library. The public library is one of the oldest buildings in Port Elizabeth. The current building, however, replaced the first building, which was destroyed by a fire in 1896. The first person on the scene of the blaze was Constable Maxwell. He unfortunately perished during the fire when a stone coping dislodged from the building and fell on top of him. When the new building was being built and during its construction, a remembrance stone was placed on a low wall. This stone was then moved into the library gardens. And this must have upset Maxwell, since room 700 then became really haunted and it was so disruptive that the stone was moved back to its original place. Another spirit attached to the library is that of Robert Thomas. For 31 years, Robert Thomas dedicated himself to the upkeep of the library as its caretaker. He was a bachelor and he had started taking care of the library in 1912, until the day he died, the 6th of February, 1943. Since then, there have been occurrences of books being stacked, and then knocked over, and also doors banging. Also, another beautiful building that should definitely have paranormal investigations done. And if there have been investigations done there, I definitely have not seen anything online. I would love to know if you know of any paranormal investigations that have been done at either the Richley House or the Public Library in Port Elizabeth. Please do send that through to me. And then the third story we're covering is that of Craddock Place. This, tra- oh, well, kind of trigger warning, I guess, for this one, because it's a bit gruesome. Um, this tragic tale is of a young slave girl who was murdered by her lover in the most gruesome way. This girl worked in the home and was thorough in what she did, which earned her the job of dusting the drawing room, which I suppose is one of those, like, the better tasks to do in the household. I mean, you're not 
scrubbing the toilets, you know, you're dusting up in one of the fancier rooms. And there was a piano in that room that she took a great liking to, and she really cared for it. She was just so drawn to this piano. So the details of what led to the murder are not clear, but it is said that her partner was consumed by jealousy and thus attacked the girl. During the attack, he threw her into the great oven in the kitchen. He locked it and built a fire underneath, which is the same as basically turning the oven on. And so you can imagine she died in a truly terrible way. That's a long, drawn-out, excruciatingly painful way to die. Since her death, the drawing room has often been filled with soft piano music when there was no one in the room. So people have heard soft piano music coming out of that room, and they are like the only person in the building, which is creepy. (laughs) Very, very creepy. I would not want to experience that. So that's the end of part one. (laughs) Like I said, this is very short. And now it's time for part two. As I was doing research for those last three stories, I came across basically a transcription of a paranormal investigation that occurred. I have tried looking up the organization that did this investigation, but they don't seem to exist anymore. There's no real links back to them. The, there's no website. There's no Facebook page. So I, I can't really find information about them. But it is Paranormal Investigations of Port Elizabeth, or PIPE. So this is a report from a paranormal investigator that was involved with PIPE. So the following is going to be verbatim quoted from the the site. The link will be in the show notes if you want to go read it for yourself. I just thought this was such a cool story, such an interesting retelling of the paranormal experiences that this investigator and the family experienced. So here we go. This story unfolded in a house in Rowellan Park. The activity was predominantly in her two-year-old son's room, which is next to their main bedroom. He often woke up and sat on his bed crying while pointing at the opposite corner. They have seen dark shadow figures in the room, experienced sudden temperature drops, and heard noises on occasion, like knocking and scratching. The toy piano in his room would suddenly start playing in the middle of the night, and then suddenly stop on its own. It has buttons that activate pre-programmed songs to start playing, and a button to stop the song from continuing. Their cat refused to enter the room. Furthermore, when one carried the cat into the room, she clearly got distressed and ran out. They reported having sudden strange feelings in the adjacent main bedroom as well, as though someone was watching them. The tenant complained that the activity had become worse, and they were getting more frightened. At this point, Paranormal Investigations Port Elizabeth began a full investigation. Our photographer, Vicky, was taking digital photographs of the rooms and passage while our other team members were setting up the equipment. The client's husband carried the cat to show us how frightened it was of coming into the boy's room. The cat immediately became agitated the moment it was carried toward the doorway. One of the photographs that Vicky had taken in the passageway showed a strange anomaly. Upon review on a larger screen, it looks like the figure of a little boy. Interestingly, at the prelim, we asked twice if the entity is the child, and on both occasions there was an audible knock. Likewise, we received a knock for the same question during the full investigation. Chantal and Vicky started with the EVP session in the boys' room while Jan was sitting in the adjacent main bedroom. While asking the entity to prove that it was there and saying that it was welcome to try and scare us, Jan heard a scratching and knocking in the adjacent room. Our camcorder spontaneously paused shortly afterward. About five minutes later, there was a sudden temperature drop and both the camcorder and digital camera malfunctioned at the same time. We changed rooms. Jan and Vicky continued the EVP questioning in the boys' room, this time in Afrikaans, while Chantal sat in the main bedroom. Unfortunately, we did not have an extra camera in the main room during this part of the investigation. After Jan playfully asked the entity to play with one of the torches in the boys' room, the torch lying on the main room's bed where Chantal was sitting acted up. It switched off, on, started flickering slightly, off, on, and then completely off. This was over a span of a minute and a half. Note that we had put fresh batteries into this torch at the start of the investigation and that it did not act up again for the duration of the investigation, which was approximately another hour. The torch was lying untouched on the bed. 
There was also a knocking sound afterward. There is a short whisper after Chantal acknowledges a sudden drop in temperature. When we asked whether we may take a photograph of the entity while it's playing with a torch, we got a short, very faint whisper, which sounds like no in Afrikaans. So they heard near, and then a bump sound. This was the second occasion that we asked for the entity to do something, and it chose to do it in the opposite room. Jan then asks the entity to do something to Vicky's camera. Shortly afterward, she reports that her battery power had suddenly dropped. During the investigation, we heard many knocking sounds. Some of these came from the cupboards. These were captured on both the digital voice recorder and the camcorder. Jan joined Chantal and Vicky in the main bedroom. The camcorder was left in the boys' room with the hope that we might get a response in the opposite room again. While continuing to ask EVP questions in the main room, we experienced sudden temperature drops, followed by knocks and bumps against the bed. These were audible and could be felt as though someone was bumping against the bed. This coincided with strange audio recordings in the boys' bedroom, occasional taps and it sounds like sniffing or scratching. There is a distinct whisper toward the end of the clip. This whisper coincides with us asking why it chose to stay behind and didn't go into the light. Jan then cracks a joke about it playing with our light, and that is when a loud whisper happens in the boys' room. We left the recording devices in the boys' room and went to the lounge to chat to the client. She voiced her concerns again over how it was frightening her and her son. She wanted it gone and asked for advice on how to go about it. We suggested that we address it directly by telling them how she felt and that it was not welcome in her home anymore. More drastic measures are only necessary if this method doesn't work. Chantal offered to go back into the room with her and to initiate the conversation. We realize that most people don't sit down and talk to paranormal entities. It is sometimes more comfortable for the client if we accompany them and help them along this part of the process. Chantal and the client sat down and started telling the entity that it was not welcome in the home anymore. We spoke Afrikaans as it seemed to be more responsive during the investigation when questions and requests were made in Afrikaans. As it was told that it was no longer welcome, the piano started playing a portion of a song. After the client told the entity how its presence made them feel and made it clear that it had to leave, the temperature dropped drastically. The client felt an ice-cold chill next to her ear, on the side where she saw a shadow figure a few days earlier. As Chantal tried to comfort the client, the K2 meter gave a quick and sudden response at the same time that the camera went out of focus. We believe that we have collected evidence in the form of audio and visual recordings and had personal experiences substantiating that there is indeed paranormal activity in both of the rooms. The evidence seems to point to the fact that there might be more than one entity present a child, and an adult. And that is the end of that story, that quote. And again, you can find that in the show notes. The link is there. If you want to read that for yourself, I would love to know more about this investigation, but I just couldn't find any info on it anyway. Thank you again for listening. Sorry that it's such a short mini-sode. This has just been a really busy week. We've got a lot going on, and with Chanel being ill, it's just been a lot but we will be back in full swing next week chanel's got a doozy of a case for us and i will definitely have a much longer story <laughs> this coming week but if you want to get in touch with us please go to our socials at law and omen we're on facebook instagram twitter we have a website lawandomen.com an email address info at lawandomen.com and you can send us your story request send us your personal experiences that you've had whether true crime or paranormal related your suggestions questions anything we have a patreon we hope you've had an amazing week and that your week ahead is going to be even better thanks for listening and we'll see you next time bye